Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna be doing a Q&A session. It's been a while since we've done a Q&A session, but we've been getting some great comments in some of our recent videos, so we're gonna look at some of your questions and answer them today. So, let's get started. Okay, first things first, we got a great question on our recent Via Impedance Calculator video from Stephen Newberry. Stephen writes, great video, thank you. I love the Symbior demo, really drives the point home. He then goes on to ask, if all stitching vias are removed, how does return current flow? Then he asks, how would the result be different if perhaps you have one or two stitching vias far away from the signal? So in that video, I presented an example with a via and then several stitching vias around it, essentially approximating a coaxial transition. And by placing these stitching vias around at a specific distance, D, from this signal via, you can then control the impedance of this via to a specific value. You then also have an anti-pad that passes through the ground plane with some other diameter, we'll just call it little d here, and these two together are what give you the impedance of your via, and most impedance calculators emit this. Now, what Stephen is saying is that first, when you have this arrangement with these stitching vias around your signal via, essentially the return current exists in these stitching vias around this signal via. So you have some capacitive coupling between this signal via and all of these other vias. So, where does the return current flow if there are no vias? Well, it essentially flows through whatever the nearest conductor is. So there could be some conductor way off here from the signal via and somewhere else in the board, you're gonna have a return current. And if that return current loop is very large, it's gonna have high inductance. It can then very easily receive EMI from some external source and it can generate a lot of noise when there is a signal propagating through this transition. Now, if you just have a couple of these vias, let's just say we have two vias right here and right here. Well, you'll have essentially some parasitic capacitance that exists between the via and these two uh, stitching vias, and that adds up in parallel. Now, as you add in more stitching vias, what's gonna happen is you're creating more parasitic capacitance that then also adds in in parallel. And so the result is that as you add in more stitching vias and you get them closer to the signal via, eventually the impedance of this via changes from inductive to capacitive. And that's what we saw in some of those examples in that earlier video. So check out the link in the description for that other video. Our next question is on our via delay calculation video. Tyrone Roy writes, Hi Zach, I'm not sure if you mentioned here if Altium can automatically calculate for the effective via delay and how can it be turned on in Altium? So unfortunately, that tool does not exist in Altium Designer. You do need a field solver in order to calculate the effective delay across that via structure. The reason is that it's gonna depend on what is located around the via, just like we were talking about in this previous question with the stitching vias located around your signal via. Now there is the LC model, and that LC model essentially takes an F3dB value, being related to one over two pi times square root of the L and C values for this via transition. This doesn't consider stitching vias either. It just considers a via, its effective inductance, and its effective capacitance. Now the problem with this is that if you just invert this equation to try and get a via delay value from this frequency, what's gonna happen is you're actually gonna overestimate a little bit. So it really is best practice to get that via delay from a field solver or from a more specialized model that can accurately account for your specific via structure. Our next question was left on our capacitor impedance video in which I derive the impedance of a capacitor with its effective series resistance and its effective series inductance. CV Afane writes, Hi Zach, in 554 equation, there is no C. So in that video, I was deriving the impedance of a series RLC circuit. And the impedance of the series RLC circuit can be written like this. And this was the equation I presented in that video. And as you can see, there is no C value as was mentioned. And that's because it's lumped in right here to the natural frequency. So remember this natural frequency is equal to one over square root 
of LC. And then if you square this and you square this, you get natural frequency squared is equal to one over LC. So the C value is lumped in here. So just remember when you're dealing with RLC circuits and you see omega zero and they omit the L and the C, that's because it is lumped into this natural frequency definition. For our next set of questions, we actually got several questions on our teardrops on differential pairs video. Let's take a look. Just another anonymous writes, is there a way to make round traces instead of right angle and 45 degrees traces? or generally follow a curved route with an inflection point when connecting two parts that are not aligned with each other? Yes, there is. So Phil actually showed us how to do this in an earlier video, and we will link to that video in the description. I'm also gonna show you how to do it right now, so open up your copy of Altium Designer and follow along. Okay, so I'm inside of an example project in Altium Designer. This is an example project that we've been using for several demos, and what I'm gonna do is route this trace over here on the left side of the screen all the way over to these two vias on the right side of the screen. So what you can do here is open up the routing tool and when you click to start routing, you will see that it does automatically start applying the 45 degree transitions. But what I can do is I can hit the tab key and then you'll see the pause symbol come up. When that pause symbol comes up, I can then access some of the options here in the properties panel. And you'll see that there are several options here for corner style. This one all the way on the right is your curved routing style. So what you'll see here is once I select that and I go back into the layout, you can already see here that it's automatically applying this corner and I can just take it over here to my destination and click and it automatically places this corner. Now, in order to select this corner, you have to make sure that you have arcs enabled in the selection filter. So you'll notice here I only have arcs enabled and then it does indeed select that arc. Once you've selected that arc, you can actually adjust it and turn it into a right angle corner or a 45 degree corner if you want. And that is how you access the arc routing tool. Our next questions deal with the vias themselves as well as the teardrop transitions into vias on a differential pair. Kamel K writes, Hello, sir. What do you mean by class three? So in that earlier video, we were talking about IPC class three performance levels. Class two and class three are two different product performance levels, and they have to do with product reliability. So class three is the highest level of reliability where human life essentially depends on the product's successful operation. Class two is a long-term reliability standard that doesn't necessarily meet the same reliability requirements as class three, but still has important requirements. Class two and class three in that context in that video refer to the relationship between via diameter and the via pad. For class two, we generally have a via with diameter, let's say D here, and then we have a pad around it with a larger diameter, we'll call this capital D, and generally we have Capital D equals little d plus eight mils for class two. And then for class three, we have capital D equals little d plus 10 mils. So this is generally the case for the highest level of producibility that PCB manufacturers can meet under the IPC standards. Now for class three, you will often see fabricators that recommend you place a teardrop on these vias regardless, just for added reliability. It's not a requirement under IPC standards, but it certainly does help. So IPC standards don't necessarily require you to place a teardrop on this via. Some fabricators will require it, but essentially if you make this pad big enough, then you shouldn't need to include a teardrop, but the teardrop does help with reliability. Now, if breakout is allowed, Typically what they will do is they will enforce the teardrop and it actually does say in the IPC standards that the teardrop is required if you're gonna allow the drill to break out from this pad. So for instance, if you make this pad smaller, you do wanna then use the teardrop to prevent that via from being severed from the trace. Our next question comes from superfan Fetty Mockney. Fetty Mockney writes, what if you move the vias far from each other so that you keep the same distance W between the two edges of the via's angular ring? I think in that case, we would not have a difference in the impedance as the distance didn't change. So this is a great question as it really relates fundamentally to how the geometry of the traces and the spacing in the differential pair gives you a consistent differential impedance. So the challenge here in this design with placing teardrops on a differential pair is when you have the two traces coming in, you have them at some specific W or width, and then some specific spacing between them or S. Now, as you break out this teardrop going into your vias, 
What you would want to do to prevent a differential impedance discontinuity between these structures is to then increase the spacing, S, as you also increase the width, W. By having just the right ratio between W and S, you could then conceivably maintain the differential impedance across this link at the constant value that you had back here. So that way you don't have any kind of differential impedance continuity. The problem is here that you are actually changing the odd mode impedance the entire way through this link. And eventually you're gonna hit a via here. And this via could have a via impedance that's actually less than the trace impedance. The result is that there is going to be some reflection off of this via at higher frequencies. And those higher frequencies generally occur at F greater than around three to five gigahertz. So if you're operating in these very high frequency ranges with digital signals, then you do have to worry about trying to make sure that you match the input impedance, Z sub in, looking into this via structure, so that way you prevent reflections off of this via. There could be some magic W over S ratio that gives you this minimum input impedance. And I think that's a very fun problem to do in a field solver. So Fetty, get at me on LinkedIn if you wanna play around with this particular research problem. And also, since you've been in so many of our Q and A's, we'll send you a t-shirt. All right, our last question comes from our other super fan, Jim Jewett. Jim Jewett writes, you mentioned that part of the problem is reduced impedance from the traces getting closer together. Does that mean it would help to put the vias to the outside, eating into the separation from other traces rather than the separation between them? That is a great question. Now the breakout like this is something that I often do. And if you wanna prevent that impedance reduction coming into this differential pair of vias, then yes, you would wanna break them out just like this. However, you could leave them and just route straight in. What you actually do depends upon the spacing that you have between these two vias and what the spacing you need to have between the two vias is, as well as this spacing here. This spacing could actually be very narrow. This spacing being narrow forces you to also have a narrow spacing between these two vias. Now, just because this is a narrow spacing, like let's say maybe six mil, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've coupled these two tightly because the definition of tightly coupled, whatever that's supposed to mean, actually depends on the substrate thickness. So if my substrate thickness between the top layer and ground, let's say, is only three mil, well here my spacing is double that. So I've actually got pretty good spacing here and the routing into these differential vias like this may not actually create too much of a problem. You just have to make sure that you have sized this flare out or flare straight in correctly to ensure that you don't create too much of a differential impedance continuity. Now, I keep bringing up the differential impedance and the odd mode impedance, but at the end of the day, going into a via transition, what really matters is the input impedance. That's what's gonna determine reflection entering into this via structure. And going the other direction, if you had a bi-directional channel, it's also what would determine the reflection coming from the other set of pads on the opposite layer. So Jim, we've answered many of your questions in the past and in our other Q&A videos. So guess what? Get at me on LinkedIn and I'll send you a t-shirt. All right, thanks for watching everybody. Keep leaving your comments and questions in the comments section. We love getting your comments and questions. And of course, you can send your Q&A questions to YouTube at altium.com. Not altium at youtube.com, youtube at altium.com. All right, thanks again everybody. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.